Hello and welcome to the discussion. This channel is here to serve as a platform for thoughtful conversations about God, philosophy, religion, history, music, and more. My name is Nahoa, and I'm here to ask questions, to seek truth openly and critically, and to share the journey with you. That's been my motto for, for about a year now, seeking truth openly and critically. Of course, I'm not perfectly rational. It's just that I desire to be a reasonable person. That means being willing to change my mind without just accepting anything I hear. I want to be better at critical thinking and navigating contemporary debates like a philosopher. So the question is how? How do we engage with arguments and the people who make those arguments in intelligent, charitable ways? That's what we'll explore today. The scholar joining and teaching us earned his bachelor's in philosophy at Purdue University and is now a doctoral student at Princeton University. This is exciting for me because I've followed him online basically since the start of my journey. His YouTube channel is called Majesty of Reason, and I think it's one of the best philosophy resources on the platform. But beyond his popular level work, he has published several scholarly articles as well as two books. His first book, The Majesty of Reason, will sort of serve as context for this discussion. So without further introduction, Joe Schmidt, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderfully. Thank you so much for having me on. And I was telling you before we came on that uh, I'm, I've seen your comments on some of my videos and I've always enjoyed them. And so, yeah, I really appreciate what, what you're doing as well. So thank you so much. Uh, like I've said, I'm honored to have you on and I'm excited to ask you some questions. We'll go from preliminaries to deeper curiosities of mine and we'll probably end with my traditional three questions. So let's talk a bit about the value of philosophy. Before we get into particular issues, could you tell us what philosophy is in general and what value you see in philosophical inquiry? Yeah, so unfortunately there is no agreed upon understanding of what philosophy is. And if you study philosophy, you'll see that this is true of pretty much any philosophically interesting term like goodness and justice and love and so on. And also you'll start to find that it's true of most terms we use more generally, like chair and table and so on. So I can't really give clean, necessary and sufficient conditions that accurately categorize philosophy across all possible circumstances. But I guess I can give some things that will help people understand what philosophy is. So first, the term itself comes from the Greek words philosophia, right? And that means the love of wisdom. So maybe the most general kind of characterization of philosophy is that it's the pursuit and love of wisdom and truth and knowledge. So that's a rough kind of gloss, um, but admittedly, that's not super duper descriptive. So perhaps a better way to characterize philosophy is that it's the systematic rigorous study of fundamental questions about the nature of reality, our knowledge of or access to reality, how we should behave, how we should think and reason, what logically follows from what, and in general, just questions like that. So it's a systematic, rigorous study of fundamental questions about those sorts of topics. Um, philosopher Thomas Metcalf gives a helpful characterization of philosophy too that I think it would be worth quoting. So uh, I wrote this down because I wanted to quote it. So as uh, Thomas Metcalf writes in his like one of his 1,000 word philosophy articles, really great website for people who are interested in short, bite-sized, philosophy written by professional philosophers for a popular audience is called 1000 word philosophy. And here's how Thomas Metcalf kind of characterizes it. And again, it's just a rough gloss. He himself recognizes that he's not really going to be able to give necessary and sufficient conditions here. So he says philosophy is a largely but not exclusively non empirical inquiry that attempts to identify and answer fundamental questions about the world, including about what's valuable and disvaluable. So that's kind of his gloss on what philosophy is. And, um, I guess I'll pause there to see if we have a see if you have any follow up comments uh, before we get into some of the value of philosophy. So understood. Oh yeah. So, I mean, in contrast to that, some philosoph some proponents of scientism will argue that unlike science, unlike science, philosophy is characterized by subjectivity, disagreement, and a lack of progress. So, how do you respond to these criticisms of the entire field of philosophy? Yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, before getting into the value of philosophy, it'd be nice to kind of uh, assuage these worries that some people have. I was using like physical metaphors, but I probably shouldn't be doing that. Okay, so I guess, you know, the, the one question here is, is philosophy characterized by subjectivity? That's one of the things that you mentioned. 
Now, I mean, like the topics investigated in philosophy aren't typically subjective, like whether God exists, uh, the nature of time, reliable ways of coming to know things. You know, like that doesn't, these don't seem to be questions that are like dependent on our beliefs or our desires or attitudes or whatever in certain ways. They don't seem to be subjective in that sense. Like it's not just like a subjective matter whether or not God exists. <laughs> there either is a God out there or there isn't. And that's independent of us, so it seems. So, I mean, the topics investigated by philosophy certainly don't seem subjective. Um, but what about the methods? Well, uh, I say that the methods also at least are typically subjective. I mean, it's like a perfectly objective matter, whether your argument is valid or sound, for instance. And argumentation and considerations of validity and soundness and so on, that's like the cornerstone of philosophy. That's like the core methods that philosophers employ is proposing arguments, analyzing them, testing them, seeing whether or not certain objections to them succeed, and so on. Um, so I think neither the topics of philosophy nor the methods of philosophy are, at least in typical instances, subjective. Um, of course, sometimes the data that philosophers appeal to or like the reasons that philosophers appeal to are subjective in character. So for instance, um, oftentimes philosophers will appeal to our intuitions. So like our states of something seeming to be the case to us on reflection, but the same is true in science. Uh, you know, for instance, the use of mathematics, you know, like the scientist believes that one plus one equals two, they don't perform some scientific experiment to find that out. They can just kind of intuitively see that it's correct. Also, the scientist uses various inference patterns and argument forms like, Hey, P is true. And if P is true, then Q is true. Therefore Q is true, right? Why do we think that that conclusion actually follows from the premises? Well, because we could just see it. It just seems obvious, right? And so we're relying on a kind of intuition there. It just strikes us upon reflection to be the case. So I think science itself is going to have to rely on these sorts of subjective elements as well. Um, so there's nothing differentially sucky about philosophy. <laughs> okay, so is philosophy characterized by subjectivity? I guess I don't really see a sense in which philosophy is negatively characterized by subjectivity that doesn't afflict other disciplines, including science. So that's a subjectivity point. What about disagreement? Well, yes, there is lots of disagreement in philosophy. But I say, um, what are they implying? Like, what is, okay, you know, what, what are they implying? What, what are you implying? Are you trying to draw any epistemological conclusions from this? Like that uh, philosophy cannot produce knowledge or that uh, it's worthless doing it? That's a normative conclusion. It's so like, what are they trying to draw from this? Whatever they're doing, they, are, they themselves are doing philosophy, right? And so in order for their reasoning to succeed, right, they themselves are going to have to be assuming that at least some instances and in applications of philosophical reasoning can indeed produce knowledge and uh, are you know fruitful modes of investigation. So um, I think if they want to draw any epistemological conclusions about what we can know on the basis of disagreement in philosophy, or if they want to draw any normative conclusions about the worth or value of philosophy from that, they're just doing philosophy and thereby vindicating philosophy as a kind of project. So that's the point about disagreement. And of course, much of science is characterized by disagreement, right? I mean, um, especially at the kind of edges and frontiers of our scientific thinking in certain debates and domains, like theories of quantum gravity and theories of dark matter and dark energy and so on. There's tons of disagreement about that. But of course, that doesn't mean that no one can know anything about these topics. It doesn't mean that there aren't truths in the domain. Those would be monstrous non sequiturs. So uh, that's that's my kind of response Wait, to the disagreement let's, let's point. Let's talk a, a bit about a, a bit more about that. You, you mentioned it's, an, it's a non sequitur to make an inference from disagreement in a field to the unreliability of that entire field. And I notice people do that with uh, ethics and there are, you know, uh, there are thoughtful philosophers who, who don't affirm objective morality, but just the argument, which is a, a popular argument, that there's disagreement on what's right and wrong to the conclusion that there is no right and wrong, or even about aesthetics. And I'll probably ask you about aesthetics a little later, but just the, the disagreement on what is beautiful doesn't imply that, that there is no such thing as beauty. And, and we're talking yeah. about that. Also. I mean, those are philosophical things as well, ethics and aesthetics. And so I, you just, you just mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, like there's, there's, uh, <laughs> I mean, listen, there's disagreement about whether or not God exists. So like if we're able to infer from disagreement to there not being like a fact of the matter, like there's no fact of the matter as to whether or not God, like that just seems bizarre or like, you know, there, there, there once was disagreement about, um, whether or not the earth revolved around the sun or whether or not the sun revolved around the earth. That, of course, doesn't mean that there was the fact of the matter and so on, right? So, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good kind of stopping point because oftentimes in, especially like popular discussions uh, with non, some non-philosophers, they are apt to make this kind of mistake. And so it's, it's 
useful to kind of pause and, and highlight that it is indeed a mistake. So um, I, I've addressed the subjectivity point. I've addressed the disagreement point. What about the lack of progress point? Um, so in my view, it's, it's not true that there has been like no philosophical progress. I think there's been lots of progress in philosophy over like the thousands of years since it's been practiced. I mean, like us having like liberal democracies and rights, and, you know, like various things embedded in constitutions came from political theorizing from philosophers and, you know, hundreds of years ago and so on. Like it's, it's well known that the U.S. Uh, Declaration of Independence and Constitution were inspired by lots of philosophical developments and political philosophy and so on. So, I mean, like, that seems to be progress over like Aristotle advocating slavery and like, you know, uh, Plato advocating like these fascist views, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that, that's a bit hyperbole, but there has been progress in philosophy and we've identified and cataloged the many varieties of valid argument forms. We've significantly advanced our understandings in debates about pretty much every philosophical topic, which you'll see if you just do philosophy, like God's existence, we've uh, weeded out lots of bad arguments and we've discovered some interesting arguments. And of course, we're at the forefront of some of them and there's disagreement, right? But lots of arguments that used to, we used to think were successful, we've come to see certain like flaws in them that are just quite devastating. So like we have indeed made progress in our understanding about these debates. What's We've an gained greater clarity. Like in yeah. debates in the philosophy of religion, what are some examples that either were widely seen as plausible or there just was debate and now they're seen as kind of kind of almost textbook it, examples of, of flawed arguments? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So one of them is like this called this uh, verifiability criterion of meaning. And this comes up within the logical positivists in the 20th century. Um, and this is a very kind of crude statement. And of course, they tried to refine it later on and so on, um, which is another example of philosophical progress, by the way. Uh, but anyway, there is this kind of crude statement of the verifiability criterion of meaning, which basically says that a sentence is meaningful only if we can like verify it empirically in some way. So like only if it's verifiable in principle through some empirical sensory means, that is a necessary condition on being meaningful. And of course, people tried to apply that to religious language, right? They tried to say, well, all this religious language is um, nonsense. It literally means nothing. It is meaningless because it, it's not, at least many elements of it are not verifiable by empirical sensory means, okay? Again, this is a bit of a, a you know crude popular presentation, you know, we can get into the weeds and so on, but, so, so this was actually monstrously popular. I mean, I, you know, thinking about it now, I can't believe how popular it was. And because uh, basically no one holds to this anymore. But, um, you know, like philosophers came to see that like that principle itself cannot be verified. It's not, it's not verifiable in principle by the empirical methodology and senses and so on. So like it would imply that itself is meaningless. And if it's meaningless, it can't be true, right? <laughs> so it kind of undermines itself in that kind of way. And so philosophers have, have made progress in that regard. This argument against uh, the meaningfulness of religious language rests on a principle which we can now see couldn't be true. So th I think that's just one example of this. And there are many throughout history of philosophy. Like if you study philosophy, you'll see these come up a time and again. So we've just gained so much greater clarity and, under and, and understanding about various debates, about various distinctions, about various arguments um, in pretty much most if not all domains of philosophy and for people who are interested i actually detail some other ones in my common mistakes series which is an ongoing seven part series on my channel where i detail common mistakes that people make in internet and internet philosophy and religion spheres and one of the mistakes that i cover therein is like hey philosophy is useless hey philosophy never makes progress etc so i think that was the first part of the series where i discussed those sorts of mistakes hmm. I appreciate that. But I do. That reminds me. Yeah, well, speak, oh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I was about to say, speaking of mistakes, we could we could talk about the value one because I just mentioned that the philosophy is useless one. So if, you, if we could, I could just briefly give an, an apology for philosophy, as it were, a defense yeah, of philosophy and its sure. value. Okay. Okay. Um, so for starters, I, in my view, it's, it's just at least intrinsically valuable. It's valuable in and of itself and not as some like means to some other end. Yeah. You know, like oftentimes people get art not because it's like, practically useful in some way, but just because they value it in itself. They, they see a lot of intrinsic value in the painting or in the, the sculpture and so on. So in my view, that's kind of like what philosophy is like. I don't think um, its merits should be determined or dictated by its practical utility. I think that's a bit crude, in fact, um, but it does indeed, I think, have practical utility in addition. So I'll cover some of that. So in my view, like I think there are lots of 
personal intellectual benefits that philosophy cultivates, like critical thinking skills, better abilities to detect BS, uh, analytical writing and reading, and so on. Being able to parse difficult texts and formulate and address the reasoning contained in arguments in those texts. Basically, seeing, being able to see whether or not conclusions follow from the premises, right? Philosophers are trained in logic, pinpointing underlying assumptions, which can help, and like, you know, kind of mapping out the dialectical terrain, which is super helpful in problem solving and so on. Being able to make distinctions that, that kind of clarify and precisify debates and issues and so on down the list. And all of this, of course, translates super duper nicely to like philosophy majors doing like extremely well on the LSAT, GRE, et cetera. So yeah, I, I do think there are lots of personal intellectual benefits of uh, philosophy. I think philosophy also helps us kind of inform our moral and political views, and that just helps us live better lives. I mean, like, it helps us flourish as humans, right? It, it helps us come to have better philosophical and political, excuse me, better moral and political views. Um, Philosophy as a discipline has benefits as well. I mean, it's well known that, that philosophy historically has given birth to lots of other fields. Once kind of philosophers and just in, inquirers more generally, once scholars gained consensus on the relevant methods for investigating the relevant domains. So, you know, like significant parts of what we now call science or once natural philosophy, economics, psychology, computer science, boatloads of other fields have even kind of somewhat recently kind of butted off from philosophy. Um, philosophy is also useful in interdisciplinary research, like lots of research in psychology is actually interdisciplinary with philosophers because philosophers help the psychologists formulate questions in, in very clear ways and be attuned to certain distinctions that the psychologists are prone to miss, um, that philosophers are attuned to. So actually there's a really good and healthy interdisciplinary dialogue and research going on. So that's super fascinating. Um, and like another point is like, in my view, philosophy is needed if only because there's lots of like bad reasoning and mistaken at philosophy out there and <laughs> that needs good philosophy to serve as a corrective doesn't it um so again if people want more on this they can check out my uh con mistake series for for some of these points you you clearly express a deep admiration for the immortality and majesty <laughs> of reason so I, I was wondering do you see reason as beautiful and if so how so like is, is that beauty a property of reason itself independent of your appreciation, or is it merely, as it were, a property of your eye, the, the eye of the beholder? Good, good, good question. Okay, so I mean, it sort of depends on what we mean by what we mean by reason. I guess like, you know, I think it's sort of like intentionally ambiguous when, whenever I whenever I use it, like, we could distinguish the faculty of reason, right? So like, that's just like, um, I guess it's a collection of cognitive capacities that uh, humans and perhaps certain extraterrestrial aliens, it's like some capacity or collection of capacities that we have to understand things, to, to form, form and grasp universal ideas, to put them together and understand the meanings of um, declarative sentences and see connections between them such that some of them like follow from the others, etc. It's like being able to see connections between ideas, being able to, I guess, tease out consequences, being able to see just kind of intellectually whether or not something is true, like that one is identical to the number one, you know, or that everything is self-identical, etc. So one understanding of reason is just like this, this set of capacities, these cognitive capacities to, um, to learn, to form judgments, to reason, to see connections between things, etc. Another sense of reason is like the deliverances of those cognitive capacities, right? Like um, kind of the outputs of them, what we conclude on the basis of them, what we learn from them. It's like almost like a body of knowledge, in fact. That, that's one understanding of reason. Um, a still further understanding of, of, of reason could just be um, true normative principles about how we should think. So like, you shouldn't believe a contradiction. You know, really, you shouldn't believe inconsistencies. You should um, believe what's true and you shouldn't believe what's false. Um, you should proportion your beliefs to the evidence. Um, more precisely, you should proportion your credence to the evidential probabilities, but uh, <laughs> just ignore that. Um, so, like, th there are these true normative principles about how we how we should think, how we should reason, and I mean that's also partly what I'm referring to with reason. And then I don't know. I, there, there are just so many different senses of reason, and when I think about all of them, I just have this kind of like it's it's awe inspiring. I don't know. Like, firstly, just the fact that we're able to grasp things and see connections between them, and tease out certain logical consequences from other things. It's just wonderful. I mean, that's just, that's crazy that that, that would be part of reality. I don't know, it, it's just crazy. I, I think it's beautiful, uh, uh, I, I really do. And 
I mean, these principles about how we should reason, you know, they have a kind of, I don't know, binding authority on us in some sense. And that gives me a sense that it's kind of like more powerful than me in some sense. You know, it's like it's above me, it like transcends me, you know, like these these principles about how we how we ought to think and how we ought to reason. Um, so like there's that sense which is like majestic, you know, it's like above me and it's mm -hmm. awe inspiring. And uh, to use to use uh Rudolf Otto's phrase from his The Idea of the Holy, it's almost like numinous. It's like this super powerful presence that is almost like kind of mysterious in some sense, but also kind of scary because it's like so powerful, you know, like, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I'm just describing my numinous experiences at this point. Um, so yeah, uh, do I think it's beautiful? It's like in most of these senses, I think that uh, there's kind of beauty um, and elegance and kind of harmony and, and uh, yeah. Now, there, there is this question that, that you raised, which is like, is that beauty kind of out there a feature of the, the, the reason itself in whatever sense we're talking about? Uh, or is it just kind of a feature of my kind of subjective reactions of it? Um, I guess put, putting it more precisely, we can ask, we have these things which I, I do indeed think are beautiful, and we can ask in virtue of what are they beautiful? Are they are they beautiful in virtue of, let's say, my subjective reactions to them, or perhaps my, my beliefs or my desires or my evaluative dispositions or, or some aspect of my subjective psychology? Or in, on the contrary, are they beautiful in virtue of certain features of the thing itself? And it would have those and be beautiful independently of mine or anyone else's beliefs and desires and attitudes and other stances. So um, unfortunately, I haven't come down on that topic in, in my own thinking. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, aesthetics and aesthetic realism, which is this question, is a monumentally controversial topic in philosophy, and it divides philosophers. And it's not my area of specialty, so I haven't studied it that much. And as a result, I just think the appropriate epistemic response on my end is a kind of suspension of judgment. Um, I don't quite know whether or not these aesthetic values are objective or subjective. A lot of people that I meet in kind of my, my daily life and I talk to, they kind of just think um, the kind of subjectivism is, is obvious about aesthetic value. But if you look at the philosophical literature, like there, there are some, some like reason, reasonable considerations in favor of, of, of realism or, or what we could term objectivism. Um, so, but, but ultimately, I don't know. Um, I don't know. No, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Um... I mean, one mark of intellectual maturity, I think, is being able to 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 just suspend judgment when you either aren't well read enough or you you haven't thought about it deeply enough. And so I respect that. Um, Rogers, Doctor Roger Scruton's little book, uh, a very short introduction to, to to beauty. He sees beauty as an objective feature of reality, as in like a mind independent feature of reality. But there are subjective elements in comparative aesthetic judgments that we make. So he's like, if we're talking about the color blue, I mean, you know, or, or the color green, my notebook is green, whether you, disagree, you, whether you agree with me or not. And, but if I say I like green and you like blue, and which one is better? He's well, that's subjective. But the fact of the colors green and blue is, is it that. It's a fact. So that, that's interesting. I'm I, I myself am still not sure where to think on this. So, so I appreciate that. That you're there with me. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's um, a journey, and maybe I'll maybe I'll eventually find out the answer. Maybe I won't. Uh, we'll see. In your book, you highlight two aspects of critical thinking: the argumentative and the communicate the communicative. You talk about intellectual virtues, and then just how to to engage with people. So, in light of this, I have two related questions. First, when someone encounters a claim or an argument, how should they interact with those ideas and exemplify intellectual virtues? And second, when someone is having a conversation or a debate, how should they interact with their interlocutor and exemplify just personal conversational virtues? Good, good, good questions. Um, so I was actually reaching for my book because, you know, I give like tangible tips and so on. And like, I can kind of just verbally summarize and elaborate a little bit upon some of them. We're not going to go through all of them, of course, but I, I really think that'll be helpful for the audience. So um, in terms of like the intellectual virtues, I mean, virtues are, are something like, you know, 
stable traits of character that help orient you towards truth in the case of intellectual virtues and, uh, you know, like goodness in the case of moral virtues. Um, so some intellectual virtues that I focus on in the book are like, one is intellectual humility, right? And that involves like basically recognizing the limits of your knowledge and the limits of, of your reasoning and your abilities and kind of orienting your focus on truth rather than like status and just being like, you know, popular in the, in the public eye and so on. But instead, at least in terms of your intellectual pursuits, you're kind of valuing the truth of the matter rather than just, you know, putting on a show as the sophists did to um, try to either sound clever or try to gain a following. Uh, instead, it's, it's kind of valuing truth. So it's recognizing your limitations and orienting your focus on, on truth. And it's just a willingness to say things like, I don't know, when you genuinely don't know, or like, I haven't researched this sufficiently, when you haven't researched it su sufficiently, and so on. All too often, we try to uh, opine on things that we haven't sufficiently studied. So yeah, intellectual humility is really just all about a recognition of the limits of your abilities and your knowledge, being willing to say, I don't know, when you genuinely don't know, and focusing yourself, orienting yourself on truth rather than like status or being seen as clever and so on. There's also intellectual curiosity, right? Which is just this like flaming passion uh, for, for inquiry and, and answering questions and, and kind of just getting to the truth of that or getting to the bottom of things. Um, just not being content with intellectual laziness. There's also intellectual perseverance, perseverance which is kind of like, Intellectual perseverance is helps you kind of keep going. So intellectual curiosity is kind of like the spark, you know, you got the curiosity there, you've got the interest there. And perseverance is kind of what what drives you through in order to try to find the answers to your questions and so on. So again, it's, it's a committed rejection of just being lazy with regard to your intellectual life. So like, actually reading these sorts of things, actually reflecting on them. No one's saying you have to do this all the time. But like the intellectually curious and intellectually perseverant individual doesn't neglect this aspect of their lives. They're, they're kind of intellectual or epistemic flourishing, right? Trying to get to, to get to the bottom of, of questions that interest them and that, that are really deeply meaningful and valuable and significant. There's yeah, open-mindedness, right? So, there? yeah, yeah. Yeah, so one thing I've, like you were talking about intellectual perseverance and just kind of perpetually learning about things and deepening your understanding, coming closer to truth. I've wondered wh when do you just come to a conclusion and not necessarily stop because coming to a conclusion you know, there's, there's always tentativeness and you, you don't, it's not like you just put that in the past. And one thing in, Ga in the introduction to Gandhi's um, autobiography, he's talking about all these experiments of truth that he's conducted throughout his life. And he has, he has this thing, and I'm, I don't want to botch it, but I'll, I'll have to paraphrase it. Um, he, talk, he says, I'm open to changing my mind on, the, on these things but I've come to these as conclusions, and so I'll live my life according to them, as, as if they were true, unless and un until I change my mind. And I think that's, that's valuable. Um, I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that's entirely reasonable. Like, so long as, so long as um, you know, like, you formed the conclusions in a justifiable manner to begin with, um, you know, like, you know, you didn't just do them through wishful thinking and through just like ignoring countervailing considerations and only reading your own side and so on. Right. Um, so long as, you know, you come to the, come to your conclusions on the basis of, you know, like at least reasonable, sufficient justification, then I think that's a totally reasonable approach. Now, you did ask, like, when, when can we get to that kind of point where, you know, you feel sufficiently settled to act as if it's true and you kind of... Um, kind of commit to it in some sense. Uh, and you're still open to revision, of course, in the face of countervailing considerations. But, you know, th there comes a point at which, you know, you could truthfully say you've committed to this and you do indeed believe it. That is a very difficult question. And I really think it's just going to be a case by case basis, you know, like in some cases, yeah. there are going to be certain pragmatic factors that make that very difficult. Like if you have an extreme peanut allergy, um, you know, it it's not going to be enough if uh, the waiter just said, Oh yeah, like there are no, there are definitely there, there aren't any peanuts in this. Um, like you, you also need to, you probably want like a second opinion. You probably want to know how careful this restaurant is, how much they take allergies seriously. You probably want to know if there are, um, if like peanuts were also prepared next alongside your food and so on. Like, right? like in in another case, if you don't have a peanut allergy and you just don't want to have peanuts, <laughs> that that might be enough evidence and justification for you to kind of conclude your inquiry. But um, in this case, if you have a severe peanut allergy, it may not be. So, like, it, it may depend on various pragmatic factors, various contextual factors. It, 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 it just depends, really. Um, 
And there's no one size fits all answer to this. I mean, it sort of just depends on the question. Just it, try to get some semblance of reasons and justification that, that seem to you sufficiently plausible to justify believing the thing and try not to ignore the other side, as it were, the people who disagree with you and at least look into them to some extent to and try to see if there are counters to the arguments that, that you've been persuaded by. And, and at some point, <laughs> I don't have a recipe, but at some point it just, no, yeah. Um, yeah, it just falls out that uh, you commit. So yeah, I mean, that's a great question, but unfortunately I don't have a one size fits all answer. No, yeah. So and yeah. Talking um, about intellectual virtues and, and you just mentioned looking for counter, for, for counter arguments, that is uh, maybe not necessarily an intellectual virtue, but something that intellectually virtuous people do. They don't just read one side. They don't just engage in confirmation bias throughout their their Yeah, sessions. yeah. They're, they're yeah, or at least they, they try to, right? That's the thing. They try right, to. Right, right. Because we're humans, right? Unfortunately, we all succumb to these biases. I do. You do. We all do. <laughs> uh, sorry to speak on your behalf, but the, no, the scientific yeah, evidence is in. The scientific evidence is in. And unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of stuff is ingrained in us. So um, we all have these biases, right? The task of the intellectually virtuous person is to at least try to mitigate them, right? I'm not trying to sit here and... I know you didn't say this or didn't even intimate it, but uh, for the audience, I'm not trying to sit here and pontificate from my oh, holy virtuous position. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm just trying to help all of us in this collective pursuit of truth and this collective process of growing and flourishing intellectually, uh, which is a work in progress for, for all of us, myself included. And so I'm really just trying to help all of us, you know, at least try to mitigate the influence of these uh, biases and factors and so on. And how do you do that? It's through trying to cultivate and trying to develop these, these virtues. So, so yeah, we've covered some of these intellectual virtues, but what, what matters also for our inquiry is that our inquiry is very often interpersonal. Right? Like we're often reading papers and discussing them with people. We engage in discussions with people online, um, in real life. Uh, we debate with people. Um, we email with people and so on. So like the intellectual life is a conversational life, right? So like these virtues or these kind of tips for how to be intellectually virtuous and how to converse in a kind of productive, love-oriented, truth-oriented, virtuous manner, these are intimately bound up with one another. So getting onto the conversational virtues, I give like 22 tips in the book um, <laughs> for like productive conversations. And um, I'll just go through some of them here. So like the first tip is to just kind of like recognize that we do indeed have these biases. Like the first step in trying to mitigate them is to recognize that we have these biases in favor of our current views, in favor of people within our tribe, as it were, those who agree with us and so on. And just trying to, trying to be open-minded and, and recognize that we really could be wrong. Um, and that, that we really don't know everything and that our, our abilities really are quite limited. And there may very well be reasons bearing on um, the conclusions that we accept. There may very well be reasons that bear on those, either for or against, of which we are unaware, right? And that can help appropriately kind of temper our confidence in our conclusions. Um, and so that we can kind of avoid being dogmatic and overconfident and we can be sufficiently open-minded. So that's the first step. We kind of recognize the biases and affirm to ourselves our limits and that uh, there may very well be things of which we're unaware and that we haven't considered. Another tip is to kind of, when you're, in, when you're conversing with someone, don't only focus on the things about which you disagree. You can try to seek common ground and that can, it kind of breaks the, the, the animosity between you guys. Like, you know, we're, we're fellow explorers on, on a team together and we actually do indeed have a lot of this common ground here. So like, let's not overlook it, right? So you can emphasize agreement. Um, too often we get bogged down in our disagreements. That's, that's something I noticed from some of my favorite philosophers when they have a a debate, you know, like, like it's YouTube, so you, you want to call things debates, but a, a lot of times if they're mature philosophers, they spend half an hour to an hour just agreeing on things. Um, I saw, I think, Dr. Joshua Rasmussen and Philip Goff on a debate about agentive cosmopsychism, and a lot of it was just, just them agreeing on things and, and appreciating each other's uh, genuine pursuit of truth, and that's okay. For some people, that might not be as fun because disagreement is provocative. You can instigate, um, but it's it's also better. Like you, you can build build better connections when you focus on on your commonalities. Exactly. I mean, it shows that they're on the same team, right? They're they're on the same path toward a common destination. They're explorers on a journey toward truth, and they're not kind of like opposing tribes who are trying to you know one up each other and who are trying to just put each other down and so on. Like that's not a recipe for fruitful, productive, love-oriented, truth-oriented exchanges of ideas. Um, 
so yeah, that that was that's another tip here, just to recognize that kind of we're on the same team and to ditch these kind of a uh, ditch these like language really affects how we think, right? And so like if we really tried to stay away from using language like eviscerated them or like utterly demolished your argument or utterly disproved what you believe or like I've utter I've totally demonstrated and proved my view um, or like I've totally discombobulated the other side. You know, like there's just these very tribalistic, very kind of triggering, colorful words. Um, they affect how we think. They affect how we see the other side. We can start to see the other side as irrational if we think that we've decisively, demonstrably proved, you know, self-evidently our side and so on. Um, and that can that can really help. I mean, that that kind of facilitates dehumanizing the other side. Like they're not they're not rational. You know, they can't see our self-evident conclusions and so on. So like it's a recipe for dehumanization. That in turn makes it kind of cements you in your current current beliefs. And if you have falsehoods and they have truths, you're going to be unable to get the truths from them because you've already right. th you already think you've kind of downplayed their their perspective, their, 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 their testimony, and you've kind of cemented yourself in your current falsehoods. And you very likely do indeed believe current, you know, things that are currently false. So yeah, so just recognizing that we're on the same team. Some alternative phrases other than like, well, you're, you're wrong because, you know, like, like things like that. What are some ways that we can communicate in more compassionate, charitable ways? Yeah, so one of them is like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give a few examples. So here's one difficulty that might afflict your view. And I'm wondering what you think about it. Yeah. It's so like, here's one difficulty that might afflict your view. I'm wondering what you think about that. So that's one. Um, or like, I don't know, here's one of the worries that I have for your view. It seems like it might imply P, but um, in my view, I think there are really good reasons to think not P. Um, so like, do you, do you agree with me that, that your view implies P and do you, do you think that there are good reasons to reject P? Um, so like putting them, putting them as questions and, and things like that. Um, and, and even if you're not putting them as questions, be like, you can say, here's an objection to your argument. Not here's a decisive debunking refutation of your, of your silly argument or <laughs> whatever. But like, um, here's an objection to premise four. Um, in my view, premise four is false because such and such. I think that's fine. You know, it's totally fine to say that. You're not saying like, um, premise four is uh, obviously false and we can totally debunk it, refute it through my decisive demonstration proof here, which I can give and, you know, et cetera. So just, just, just you know, communicate to others how you would kind of want them to communicate to your own uh your own arguments and so on now of course some people some people like that kind of um one upmanship and um i guess uh debate bro kind of thing but at least if you're interested in truth uh you're, you're not going to be very interested in that in that sort of thing i don't think um so yeah as for further tips i mean yeah like be willing to learn from your dialectical partner recognize that they probably have some insights that, that you can learn from and that you can appreciate and benefit from um, again, genuinely say, I don't know. And you genuinely don't know something. Don't just like make up a response on the spot. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's harmful because you're, I mean, it, again, it's like showing that you're caring more about kind of your status and being able to kind of cleverly respond than you are about truth. And it can kind of pollute the epistemic space if you're putting in there responses that you don't even know if they're successful <laughs> and, um, you may not even believe them yourself <laughs> because you, you're kind of just saving face from this objection and so on. So yeah, um, that's another thing. Um, try to perspective take, like try to really see things from the other person's perspective. Like think about their life experiences of your dialectical partner, try to place yourself in his or her shoes and really try to humanize them rather than dehumanize them. Um, ditch caricatures right don't just try to fit someone into a pre-existent mold like ah oh, yes this is the typical new atheist and i'm going to fit them into that pre-existent caricature or mold and then interpret everything that they say through that lens like it's quite obvious how that's going to um not facilitate the productive exchange of ideas between you and that person we're each individuals with our unique perspectives and so on we don't normally fit into those kind of boxes um another tip is immersion like like genuinely immerse yourself in like other people's communities, right? Like you don't just want to be indoctrinating yourself with solely like far right conservative media, like just try, try to read a diverse array of sources um, because different sources are going to have different biases. They're going to focus on different aspects and different elements and different angles of issues. They're going to raise objections that this side isn't covering sufficiently or they're downplaying or they're even ignoring. So it's super important to immerse yourself in these kind of what I say, non echo chamber contexts. An echo chamber is basically where um, voices from the other side are excluded from your epistemic community and perhaps even discredited. So like their testimony doesn't really count for much. Their reasoning doesn't really count for much and so on. So like really try to get out of that echo chamber. 
because um, again, it's kind of inoculating you from um, being corrected. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are just some things that uh, I think are really helpful tips. Let me see if there are any um, any other tips. Oh yeah, another one is like to, to really try to listen and be fully present to your dialectical partner. Like way too often, we're just preparing the next response in our minds, and we're just waiting for them to shut up so we can we can get in our response. Like that, that's that's not how we learn from one another, and that's not how we kind of we can grow through these conversations uh, philosophically and intellectually. Um, so just try to be fully present and, and listen to the other person. And finally, I guess it's all right, indeed, preferable to go slowly. Like philosophy is best done slowly. Um, these kind of clever gotcha type remarks, they typically only alienate your dialectical partner. They make them less likely to accept the truth and your own views. Um, if you just go slowly, cautiously, carefully, and lovingly, things will go generally more smoothly. So those are all my uh, all my tips. Oh, a final one, final one, final one. Sure. Don't straw man your opponent. Actually, try to steel man them. So if they give you an argument, try to improve upon it. Like say, okay, you, you overlook this this problem, but there, there's actually an interesting way that you, we can strengthen your argument so as to avoid that problem. So, so here's that strengthened argument. Like that re reduces so much tension and tribalism in your discussion, right? Because you're, you're literally taking their argument and improving upon it. Like it shows you care about them. You're genuinely listening to them. You're genuinely curious about the argument. You want to see get to the truth of the matter because you know, you're not just trying to score points in this current dialectic. So yeah, I think uh, all these tips are um, pretty helpful. And uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think those are very helpful, valuable strategies. Um, I, I want to ask you one, maybe a few more questions, but how much time do you have? I, I mean, I could go longer. I've got probably like 30 more minutes. That's, that's okay, fine. Okay, that's good. All right. So when I spoke to Dr. Michael Humer, he said that he thinks most people are usually irrational when it comes to higher level ideas. Many of our belief forming faculties, such as perception, are generally reliable, but it's not normal for people to think critically. We accept things without sufficient study. We reject things because of biases. We make hasty inferences. We resort to fallacies regularly. We leave terms vague because we didn't invest time in clarification and, and so on. So what are some specific areas of discussion in which you notice pervasive mistakes in thinking? It could be related to any issue, you, you know, ethics or science. You mentioned some social philosophy um, or comparative religion as what we've been talking about a bit. So just areas where you notice a lot of people making uh, errors in their in their thinking i have just the series for you it's my common <laughs> mistakes series parts one through seven <laughs> um yeah no i mean i'm really putting together this, this series because i really do think that they can help people and when i see people make these mistakes I, i'm going to try to you know lovingly link them to the video not be like you're a moron check out this point in the video or something like that um but like um Hey, uh, I address this uh, this objection, or I address this point in this video. You can check out the timestamp from here to here, and just link them to the video or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, the my common mistake series goes goes through a lot of these sorts of mistakes, and I mean, unfortunately, they are kind of like everywhere. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you did you did ask me about kind of particular ones in which we're particularly prone to these mistakes and biases and, and failures and critical thinking and so on. I guess one would definitely be like probability. Uh, oh my goodness, we uh, like I mean, just in the the, the so the psychological literature, like we have so many probabilistic biases, like base rate neglect and totally misunderstanding, like the nature of, of evidence and evidential confirmation and um, thinking like conjunctions are more probable than one of the conjuncts individually and so on. Um, so, yeah, we have lots of we're, we're pretty bad reasoners about probability, which is unfortunate. So probability is definitely one of them. I guess a few others like. In general, I just think we engage in so much biased inquiry. Just like we systematically downplay objections to our views. We discredit sources that disagree with us solely on account of them disagreeing with us. We ignore or downplay evidence against our beliefs and we seek out and, you know, overhype uh, reasons for our beliefs and so on. They're just biased inquirers in general. And it's quite unfortunate, but. Uh, just inquiry in general is that that's that's one um another really pernicious thing is like polluted epistemic communities so you know there, there are these things called epistemic bubbles that's basically where opposing voices are excluded from your relevant like social circles and your investigative practices um and they're also echo chambers which are basically like 
epistemic bubbles, but where the opposing voices are not only excluded, but also like systematically discredited and downplayed. Um, and this, I mean, these sorts of things are very pernicious. They lead to like cult-like behavior and so on. Um, and I mean, we're just so prone to that. Like it, even in like everyday matters, like we'll just only listen to conservative media or we'll only listen to liberal media or we'll only listen to atheist YouTubers and podcasts and so on. It's just, it's not, it's not intellectually healthy. I don't think, um, hmm. there's also, you know, in addition to these kind of polluted epistemic communities, well, I guess not in addition to that part, part of the polluted epistemic communities is like hero worship. We're super duper prone to that, like putting someone on a pedestal and kind of just uncritically accepting what they say. And just, uh, yeah, it's really bad. The, the hero worship, letting bad ideas and low quality work kind of fester within these communities. Um, there's a lot of tribalism and like weaponization of arguments to kind of beat down the other side. Um, and of course, you know, just the usual topics are, you know, things like religion and politics, <laughs> the two main ones, but also just lots of other things, just things that people get passionate about. So I guess that's my rambly answer to your question. Um, no, yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that. And I appreciate that to, to go into a, a very specific thing that a lot of it has been not just preliminary, but, um, sort of general or talking about critical thinking in general. So to apply some of what we've been talking about, fallacies and whatnot, in your book, you discuss the fallacies of composition and division. And you know the, the properties of the parts are not necessarily shared by the whole and vice versa. So these are just well-established informal fallacies. And we both know Dr. Joshua Rasmussen and his work, you much better than me. So I wanted to ask you about his construction problem. There's different contexts where he, he talks about a construction problem. So one of his arguments for a necessary foundation of reality appeals to the idea that contingent things cannot collectively form a necessary totality. And one of his arguments for the immateriality of the mind appeals to the idea that a system of unconscious neurons cannot produce a, a conscious mind with intention, intentionality and qualia and whatnot. Of course, he's addressed the potential objections that this line of reasoning is fallacious, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on his two construction problems. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, just a, a few notes uh, at the outset before I offer just a few thoughts. Um, and, you know, like multiple, I could probably write like, you know, multiple papers on, on these sorts of things, right? So I'll just have to kind of limit myself to a few things here. Um, but, but yeah, a few notes before getting into those things. Uh, firstly, um, the audience should at least be aware that, you know, Josh has like several independent arguments for these conclusions, not just like right. construction yeah. arguments. So I, I don't want to, not, not that you were doing this, but I don't want to at least, uh, to be fair to Josh, I don't want to lure people into mistakenly thinking that these sort of exhaust the considerations that move Josh to these conclusions. I guess the second note is that, um, you know, Josh is aware of the considerations that I'm going to, to raise here. I have many other considerations, but uh, Josh is aware of the considerations that I'm about to raise. And he and I have gone back and forth a ton about all this stuff over the years. So there's always more to say in response and counter response and counter counter response and counter 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 response. Okay, you get the idea. So that's the second note. And then the third note is that um, uh, for the audience, like people should know, and again, you were, you were not implying this again, uh, but the audience should know that Josh is not reasoning that simply because the parts of something have a property, therefore it follows that the whole must have the property. Instead, usually, um, when he's inferring uh, that, like, um, let's say, dependent parts cannot can only form a dependent whole, or that, like, you know, unconscious parts, and you know, talking about a conscious whole and so on. Like when he, when he's doing these things, oftentimes he's appealing to other sorts of philosophical tools that are perfectly kosher and perfectly respectable, like inference to the best explanation, induction, intuition, etc. So he's not he's not sort of just um, appealing to these crude fallacies that as you as you indeed recognized are just kind of documented informal fallacies that should not be committed so um those are three notes uh that i wanted to make very explicit at the outset um so in the case of the mind and, and the construction problem there i'll just make two notes again m much more can be said on on these sorts of things but i'll just make two notes firstly we should we should make a distinction between not seeing something and seeing that something is not the case right so like uh i do not see so so there's this conjecture in mathematics it is called the gold box conjecture it says that every even number greater than two is the sum of two primes pretty sure i got that right uh <laughs> going off memory here 
So um, no one has proved this yet. No one has disproved this yet. So it's kind of like an open, that's why it's called a conjecture. It's kind of like an open question in mathematics. We, I mean, we've, you know, uh, we've cataloged like, I think it's like millions at this point, uh, up, upwards of like millions of numbers that, that, it, that it's true of, millions of even numbers. Um, but of course, you know, until we have like a mathematical proof, the mathematicians aren't going to sign off on it. So um, it's kind of like an open question whether or not this is true. So here's something that is true. I do not see that the gold box conjecture is true. Right? Like I don't just like intuitively see, oh yeah, it's obviously true. Right? Um, it's in, in the way that I can see that like everything is identical to itself. Um, so, so I don't see that the Goldbox conjecture is true, um, but that's very different from me seeing that it's not true, right? Like, <laughs> uh, that's also, that's, that's not the case. It's not the case that I see that it's false. You know, I, it's not the case that I see that it's not true. That Seeing that it's not true would be like seeing that it's not true, that something can be both red all over and green all over at the same time. Uh, yeah, I can see that that's not the case. That's not the case for anything. Nothing can be red all over and green all over at the same time. Um, but. I just want to make this distinction, right? In one of these cases, you simply fail to see something. In the other case, you do indeed see something and you see that it is not the case, right? So one of them involves just a failure of sight, as it were, a failure of intellectual apprehension or failure of um, being able to intuitively see that something is the case. And the other one is actually intuitively seeing positively that something is not the case, okay? Those are different. Um, and speaking for myself, <laughs> this is just a confession, um, I, I fully grant that um, I don't see that the brain can produce, or that like uh, unconscious neurons can produce uh, conscious qualia, intentionality, et cetera. I don't see that the brain can do that. It's not like I positively see, oh yeah, that can definitely happen, you know, in the way that I can definitely see that like I can clap, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I, I don't see that the brain can produce consciousness, but that's very different from me seeing that it cannot. Uh, and I, I actually, I don't have that intuition. I, I don't have the intuition that unconscious neurons cannot produce, uh, you know, conscious mental states and so on. So again, I, I don't see that they can, and I don't see how they can, but that's very different from saying, I see that they can. Uh, and I don't really even have that intuition. I just don't really have an intuition either way as to whether or not they can. Um, I mean, of course, you know, they seem radically different to me. Uh, that, that I definitely have that intuition, um, but like radically different things interact all the time. Sometimes they produce one another, you know, like a, a quantum field, which is producing certain excitations, which are electrons or various particles. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, while it is the case that I don't see that the, the unconscious neurons can produce a conscious mind with intentionality, it's actually not the case that I see that that can't happen. Uh, and for me, like in order to go along with the kind of construction problem, I think I'd have to have that positive intuition, like you really can't get this from this. Like that, you have to have that intuition for the consumption problem to work. I think um, you really have to be able to see that it that cannot happen. But I don't see it. I don't, I don't really have that intuition. I just confess. So that that's the first thing to say. Um, the second thing to say, and you know, Josh is well aware of this. And in fact, I think this has uh, really strongly pushed him towards idealism. And I, you know, I think it's fairly safe to say, I mean, if you look at his tweets and so on, and, you know, through my personal interactions with him and so on, and, and indeed what he's written in his books, um, I think he can, he can be accurately categorized as an idealist. And I think this consideration has pushed him towards idealism. And, but, but for a lot of people who run the construction problem, they don't want to go, go the idealist route. So I'm basically saying this in response to them. It's the reverse construction problem, just as, so like, let me grant, let me just say, so hypothetically, suppose that I do have this intuition that unconscious bits of matter cannot produce conscious, intentional, minded things or, or whatever. Um, suppose that I did have that intuition, intuition. Well, then it would equally seem true to me that uh, purely conscious, mental, intentional things cannot produce a kind of extended, mindless matter. You know, like if, if they're so categorically different that, that the mindless stuff can't produce the minded stuff, it seems like then they're so categorically different that the mind, minded stuff cannot produce the extended material mindless stuff. That, that's how, it, that's how it, it would seem to me if I grant the first intuition. Like these two seem to be on par. So just as you can't, for instance, take sand and somehow bash sand together to make like a ghost, <laughs> which is like this immaterial mind. So too, you can't take ghosts together and somehow mash them together and get sand. Right? That, that, I mean... It, to the extent that the first is intuitive, I think the second is, is just as intuitive to me. So there's this reverse construction problem. And so if you if you really do go along with thinking that, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> unconscious bits of matter can't, can't produce a mind, I think you're probably going to have to say purely mental resources cannot produce 
uh, purely non-mental material extended stuff. Um, and so the way the way you would solve that is you say, well, yeah, there definitely is mental stuff. Um, <laughs> so let's just shave off the non-mental material things. Um, I mean, of course, you know, they think that there are physical things, you know, like they agree that there's like a, a cup here, but they just think that, you know, it's, it's either like a collection of mental images in God's mind or the universal mind or, or something like that. In some manner, they're not, you know, mindless material things as common sense might ordinarily conceive of them. So to the extent that there's a construction problem in one direction, it seems to me that there would be a construction problem in the other direction. Uh, and if that's the case, I think one is ultimately going to have to be pushed towards idealism. But a lot of people who run the construction problem do not want to go that direction. They do not want to go to idealism. And I, I basically say this is a problem for you guys who are not going to the idealism route. Uh, that's that's what the reverse construction problem is. Um, so, yeah. I mean, okay, you did ask about contingency. I mean, let me let me just say briefly, I mean, you know, Josh has lots of different contingency arguments that he's developed. So honestly, I'd probably just have to see like the particular argument and like which exact construction problem he's being appealed to. So uh, I'm just going to refrain from talking about the contingency argument here. That's yeah, that's totally fair. I'm trying to think what <laughs> what else I want to ask you, because I, I have so many questions from that. Um, maybe I'll just ask you one more before we get into the conclusion. You made a okay. distinction at the beginning between not seeing and seeing not, and this ties into debates in the problem of evil. So in, in such debates, the skeptical theists argue that not seeing reasons for God allowing evils does not justify an inference to thinking that God has no reasons for allowing evils. Um, and I'm not immersed in the literature, so perhaps the following is a naive intuition. But in certain cases, I have the positive seeming that if someone were able to stop a particularly horrendous evil, then they ought to stop it. It seems as though sometimes you can perceive the horror of an evil as well as the fact that it should have been prevented if it could have been prevented. Um, and so that would you know, naturally imply that there are some gratuitous evils. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, honestly, I'm inclined to agree. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I've had similar, I've said similar things in, in some videos of mine, notably the, actually the most popular video on my channel, which is 12 hours long, <laughs> at some point in there, maybe it's like the six hour, 54 minute mark, who knows? At some point in there, I was like, yes, yeah, so, you know, like sometimes I do indeed have these kind of positive seemings that, uh, you know, like anyone with the power to stop this atrocious thing and who knows that it's going on is just obliged to do it um even even if it would have like good consequences later down the road or something like that yeah like i just have the positive for, seeming and for our audience, yeah go on well i i would give an example if it was just like us or me, me and some other interlocutor just in a room but like i i don't want to do it on youtube but just think of like the mo if you want to think of a particularly horrendous evil like just some horrible thing and then i don't know if, if you'll share the intuition that if someone or, or some strong guy was able to stop it then then they should have yeah yeah i mean so here i mean i i just tend to agree um i mean i'm not like dogmatically confident in that because you know there is reasonable disagreement if we're like Firstly, like the content of these intuitions, like whether we're kind of accurately identifying the content, like maybe we're really just intuiting that this is like really, 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 really bad, um, but maybe not necessarily that uh, you know, like anyone with the power and knowledge to be able to stop this kind of ought to do so, that they're obliged to do so. So there's some skepticism on that. I mean, I, I don't really find that too convincing. Like I know the contents of, I generally know the contents of my intuitions and so on. <laughs> um, but, uh, and you know, some other people say, well, like, you know, you can't really trust that intuition because it would kind of have to be latching onto these super duper complex facts that that it'd be really implausible for it to latch onto, like whether or not God has all things considered reason to refrain from intervening. Um, so like, I just want to mention for the audience, there are ways to push back on this. And I've just been kind of outlining or adumbrating too. Um, for those interested, they can check out my kind of semi-recent video with Dr. Perry Hendricks on skeptical theism and the problem of evil. We actually talk about at least a, a super duper closely related issue in there about the common sense problem of evil. And I, I try to give Perry some pushback on it. Um, but uh, I think it was an informative discussion. And um, I'm inclined at the end of the day to end up, yeah, w where kind of you were mentioning in, in your question to me. Um, but I recognize that there there is sort of reasonable disagreement on that. 
Yeah, I appreciate that, and I'll link that in the description. Um, as the brief conclusion to every video, I ask my guests three somewhat more personal questions. And the first is just what's something significant on which you've changed your mind, whether from study or experience or just discussions like this? Great. So I will give you three, in fact. Uh, <laughs> this is certainly not all the things on which I've changed my mind, but it is three kind of salient, well, salient ones when, when you, you mentioned that this was a potential question to ask. <laughs> so um, one was, well, uh, when I was younger, I uh, was a very devout Christian. Um, then in high school, as a result of really kind of studying and reading up on the work of um, Jeffrey Lauder and uh, Paul Draper, and eventually Graham Oppie and others, um, I became a naturalistic atheist. And then, plot twist, in senior year of high school, um, I started reading the work of people like Alexander Proust and Josh Rasmussen, and they awakened me from my dogmatic metaphysical naturalist slumbers, and I became an agnostic. So, <laughs> and that has persisted to today with, you know, some, some shifts in like, hey, I no longer think that this argument is plausible, and I do think that this particular new argument is plausible and so on. So there have been, you know, certain shifts and so on, but still an agnostic here. Um, but that, those are two pretty big changes of, of, of mind there. So that's with regard to kind of like God questions and religion and so on. Um, the second one that I wanted to mention is um, I used to think that kind of like moral realism, the view that there are truths about what's good, bad, right, and wrong that are true independently of anyone's stances or preferences or beliefs or desires and so on. Um, I used to think that, that was kind of like the ordinary view held by like basically most people um, as a matter of, you know, kind of common sense that that like, you know, basically, you know, this is like what the person on the street believes. I, I sort of thought that. And I've come to think that, that that's uh, probably not the case. Uh, you can, people can see my discussion with Lance Bush on my channel. Um, I mean, I still think, you know, in my view, you know, I'm a moral realist and I find the view very, uh, intuitively attractive. I think it has lots of other, uh, theoretical benefits and so on. Um, but I think the empirical evidence definitely doesn't support the view that, uh, moral realism is like, you know, this view that's kind of like held by most people. Uh, so if people are interested on the empirical evidence of that. In your discussion with Dr. Lance Bush, that's where he argues that that moral realism is is not the common sense view, right? Yeah. So he he, he basically argues that um, at least in general, um, ordinary non philosophers don't tend to even have determinate commitments about meta ethics, like in virtue of what uh, uh, their moral beliefs are. They they most often just have the kind of first order normative judgments like, hey, that's wrong and that's right mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but that that actually underdetermines whether or not they are realists who think that those judgments are true independently of anyone's stances. Uh, on the one hand, it underdetermines whether they're realists in that sense or whether they're anti-realists, whether they think those judgments are true, but nevertheless depend on uh, people's stances in various ways. Um, so, so yeah, um, the work of Lance Bush and, and actually lots of others, there's kind of a growing literature on that in, um, the folk psychology of metaethics literature. Uh, I no longer think that is the kind of, I no longer make the empirical claim that this is the view that like most people mm -hmm. kind of pre-theoretically believe and hold. So that's another one. Um, and then the third one that I'll mention is that um, I used to be far more sympathetic to causal finitism, the view that nothing can have infinitely many causes. I used to be far more sympathetic to that. Indeed, I probably leaned toward thinking that it was true at some point. Um, but now I'm, as a result of, uh, you know, extensive research and papers that are under review and papers also that I've, I've recently published, um, I am far less sympathetic to it now. So, um, so yeah, those are three, three dimensions along which I've changed my mind. Yeah, that's good. Um, now, what about some more personal factors? Factors that don't necessarily constitute propositional evidence, so not a piece of evidence or, or you know, some argument, but things like your environment or your history that influence your worldview. Yeah, well, I mean, I, surely some of my intuitions are explained, unfortunately, by like sociocultural upbringing. Um, so maybe because I was brought up Catholic, uh, you know, with like these really kind of strong moral views and so on, and maybe be, because there was actually some discussion of like meta ethics in, in my kind of um, in some like the theology classes that I took and so on. Um, like it wasn't under the label of meta ethics, but like we were definitely discussing it. Um, maybe because of that, that has shaped my intuitions and that partly explains why I'm a moral realist. Maybe, I don't know, maybe like my socio, <laughs> socio-cultural upbringing. Um, maybe, I don't know. 
Um, so that's one. Here, here are some other ones that, that are interesting that came to mind when, when you were saying that. Um, there's a lot of epistemic vice and just like poor epistemic practices within certain communities. And that just makes me so resistant to hold the views that those communities have. I mean, I, I do, th this is kind of cheating because I, I do kind of think that that's an evidential consideration. Like if they were really, if they really had the truth, like would we expect them to be engaging in, in such atrociously bad epistemic practices? Like <laughs> if, they, if they're engaging in such bad epistemic practices, um, we wouldn't really expect them to, uh, to latch on to the, to, the, to the truth of the matter. So um, anyway, <laughs> there might be kind of evidential considerations here, but there is also some personal element to it. Like I am just very opposed to like going along with views that are associated with communities that are just deeply ingrained in which are deep epistemic vices, poor epistemic practices, bad scholarship, low quality work, and so on. Like, I'm just very unattracted to that. And it, it, it's just of kind of repulsive to me. Life. Oh, I'm going to get canceled <laughs> if I give you some examples. Um, uh, uh, let, let's see. Um, I mean, it, you don't absolutely have to. Like, you, maybe you could tell me afterward if you want, but I, I'm just curious. Okay, well, th this one, I truly don't care if I could, if I could cancel over this, I don't care. Um, so, like, I have noticed that, and I'm not saying this is true of all of them, okay? Let me, let me, let me repeat that. I'm not saying this is true of all of them. But I have found that the presuppositionalist community is mm -hmm. not very... Uh, epistemically virtuous in my experience okay so like that that's one example there are many other examples but like uh, presuppositionalism and presuppositional apologetics and so on like uh, just the, the poor epistemic practices that i've witnessed within such communities very widespread in my experience um just makes that kind of approach and way of viewing things and way of going about things just very distasteful and unattractive to me um mm -hmm. so so that's one example that that hopefully wouldn't get me canceled i mean there are lots of other examples but uh th i i shouldn't say them uh sure. <laughs> um okay so th there's there's also another one which is interesting and again another one what i mean by that is that uh it's another more personal factor that can influence my worldview so within our epistemic lives there's an interesting balance between maximizing true beliefs and minimizing false beliefs okay these are like the the among others these are two tasks of the inquirer right to, to try to get as many like true beliefs as they can and have as few false beliefs as they can. Um, but like notice, like if you tried to maximize your true beliefs while ignoring the kind of minimizing false beliefs constraint, what would you do? You would believe literally everything because then you'd, you'd, you'd believe all the truths, right? You'd have as many true beliefs as possible, even though you'd be believing P and not P for any P, right? So, um, I mean, that would be kind of disastrous, right? So that's why we need the other constraint. But notice what you'd do if you kind of went too far onto the other end of the spectrum and you only respected the constraint of minimizing false beliefs, what would you do? You'd suspend judgment on absolutely everything. You wouldn't form any beliefs whatsoever because then you'd be guaranteed to have no false beliefs, right? So we've got these two competing uh, desiderata that, that pull on us in our intellectual lives. One is maximizing true beliefs. Um, and if we went to the max on that, to the extreme at the expense of minimizing false beliefs, we'd believe absolutely everything. And then we also have this desideratum of minimizing false beliefs. And again, if we went to the extreme on that, we would disbelieve it. We would suspend judgment on literally everything. Um, and there's an interesting question then. How are these desiderata supposed to interact with one another? Like, should we be preferring one of them over another? And I mean, it, that gets into kind of like whether or not we're kind of epistemic risk takers, right? Like if we're epistemic risk takers, then maybe we're going to be willing to actually you know, we kind of value maximizing true beliefs more than we do minimizing false beliefs. And so maybe we're willing to kind of go out on a limb and, and, and kind of believe some things that other people would be less inclined to believe with the same evidence, you know? Um, so like, yeah, I mean, I, there are examples of this all over the place, but, um, you know, like someone might be more inclined to suspend judgment because they value minimizing false beliefs more than someone else who values maximizing true beliefs. And so they're just like, you know what? Um, my evidence, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to side with one side because that's going to, it's going to maximize my chances of, of getting some true belief if you do this for enough, enough uh, questions and so on. So like, anyway, I've always wondered whether this is this kind of, like what I value in this regard and my dispositions in this regard have influenced uh, my epistemic practices and my doxastic states. Um, I think I'm actually more inclined to... Uh, dislike false beliefs than I am to like true beliefs. Uh, it's, uh, 
I, I'm not really a big epistemic risk taker in that regard. And so maybe that makes me suspend judgment on more things. I don't know. Um, so I, I've always wondered that. Uh, like, is, is that true of me? And, and to what extent is this true of different people? To, can there are different values here, um, which conflict with you know, these two conflicted things, depending on how they value them, um, can that kind of influence how people go about forming beliefs and whether or not they suspend judgment as opposed to believe, as opposed to disbelieve? Uh, and, and, and maybe that's so. And, and maybe because I am less of an epistemic risk taker than other people, I am more inclined to suspend judgment about questions, even though uh, we would have, let's say, similar evidence. Um, so, I mean, that's, it's an interesting thing to think about and to reflect on. Um, and yeah, I mean, like if I had to guess, I'd probably guess that my aversion to false belief is stronger than my attraction to true belief. That's not to say that I, I don't want true beliefs, um, but it just feels like such a violation of the majesty of reason to have false beliefs. <laughs> oh man. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's like um, being more, being more willing to avoid these violations of the majesty of reason than it is to be uh then, then I am willing to um, believe more in accord and be harmonious with it. Uh, I don't know. It's weird. I don't know. I'm just kind of speculating at this point, but it's another thing that I've thought about, you know. Um, I'm yeah. just trying to be honest and reflective here, so. Yeah, that's such an intriguing consideration. I, I, I'll i probably spend the week reflecting on that to see if I care about more, if I care more about maximizing my true beliefs or minimizing my false beliefs. I, I'd assume for me it's probably the former, but I'll think about that more. Um, well, the last thing is just any final thoughts. If you want to plug, you know, plug your own stuff, or if you want to give advice to me or our audience, or just anything you, else you want to say. Yeah. So, I mean, I, firstly, thank you for having me on. This is this is wonderful, uh, and I'm going to give advice. People don't click away just because I said thank you. Okay, I probably shouldn't have said that. I probably should have waited. Um, so, here's some here's some like advice or resources and so on. Like. I highly recommend anyone who's interested in this discussion, like how to do philosophy, how to think philosophically, how to cultivate these intellectual virtues, how to engage in productive conversations. You guys are going to love my uh, doing philosophy playlist. I have so many videos in there that, that are on these topics of like intellectual virtue and like how to reason and how to think. And I have lots of actually um, book recommendations in there. So like two videos in particular that I think would be really helpful to people uh, are going to be how to analyze arguments like a philosopher, my video there. Actually, one of my one of my favorite videos. That's close to my heart. Uh, and then, secondly, uh, my video, "What Is Philosophy?" At the end of both of those, I give resources for books. Uh, I mean, like some of those books include things like Humor, Michael Humor's Knowledge, Reality, and Value. Highly recommend that. Very clear, a very good introduction to philosophy. Um, get Julian Bagini's "The Philosopher's Toolkit." Um, definitely know some logic. So, for example, you can pick up the uh, intro to Classical Propositional Logic, and some quantified logic. Uh, you can pick up Language, Proof, and Logic. That is the book. Um, uh, there are also too many to recommend. So like, just see those two videos that I just mentioned for us and for the recommendations. I remember watching those um, videos when I was homeschooled in middle school. And so my reading that I would assign myself were just the book recommendations <laughs> in those videos. And I would be yes. Like 101 principles. I, I can't remember what it was called, or the, the philosopher's toolbox. I would, so I there is this one. Um, yeah. Just yeah. the arguments, 100. And then there's also, uh, let's see, there's like the mistakes one, the 101 fallacies. Oh, yes, it's right here. Just give me, give me one second. I have all these books piled up next to me. So um, the bad arguments, 100 of the most important fallacies in Western philosophy. So um, those two are great as well. I'd recommend checking those out. So I mean, yeah, there are so many books to recommend. But uh, oh, there was one that I intentionally got out for this discussion, which I also really like. And I, I, I recommend this one in those videos, too. But it's called Philosophical Devices, Proofs, Probabilities, and Possibil or, Proofs, Probabilities, Possibilities, and Sets by David Papineau. Very, very good and, and pretty accessible. Very accessible, in fact. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll help people kind of get up to grips with a lot of contemporary analytic philosophy. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor to have you on to our audience. Thank you and peace.